Chapter Four. Cinder lay on the ground. Yes, here we go, guys. Staring up at the Rampion's vast engine, its ductwork and revolving life support module, the system blueprints she downloaded weeks ago were overlaid across her vision. A cyborg trick that had come in handy countless times when she was a working mechanic in New Beijing. She expanded the blueprint, zooming in on a cylinder, the length of her arm. It was tucked near the engine room's wall. Coils of tubing sprouted from both sides. That has to be the problem, she muttered. She dismissed the blueprint. She shimmied beneath the revolving module, dust bunnies gathering around her shoulders, and eased herself back to sitting. There was just enough space for her to squeeze in between the labyrinth of wires and coils, pipes and tubes. Holding her breath, she pressed her ear against the cylinder. The metal was ice cold against her skin. She waited, listened, adjusted the volume on her audio sensors. What she heard was the door to the engine room opening. Glancing back, she spotted the gray pants of a military uniform in the yellowish light from the corridor. That could have been anyone on the ship, but the shiny black dress shoes. Ah, Kai. Hello, said Kai. Her heart thumped. Every single time, her heart thumped.、Whew. Back here, Kai shut the door and crouched down on the far side of the room, framed between the jumble of thumping pistons and spinning fans. What are you doing? Checking the oxygen filters. One minute. She placed her ear against the cylinder again. There, a faint clatter, like a pebble banging around inside. Aha! She dug a wrench from her pocket. And set to loosening the nuts on either side of the cylinder. As soon as it was free, the ship fell eerily quiet, like a humming that became noticeable only after it stopped. Kai's eyebrows shot upward. Cinder peered into the cylinder's depths, before sticking her fingers in and pulling out a complicated filter. It was made of tiny channels and crevices, all lined with a thin gray film. No wonder the takeoffs had been rocky. I don't suppose you could use some help. Nope. Unless you want to find me a broom. A broom? Raising the filter, Cinder banged the end of it on one of the overhead pipes. A dust cloud exploded around her, covering her hair and arms. Coughing, Cinder buried her nose in the crook of her elbow and kept banging until the biggest chunks had been dislodged. Ah, a broom. Right. There might be one in the kitchen. I mean, the galley. Blinking the dust from her eyes, Cinder grinned at him. He was usually so self-assured that in the rare moments when he was flustered, it made all of her insides swap wrong side up. And he was flustered a lot lately. That is so cute. Since the moment he'd woken up aboard the Rampion, it was clear that Kai was twelve thousand kilometers out of his element. Yet he adapted well in the past weeks. He learned the terminology. He ate the canned and freeze-dried meals without complaint. He traded his fancy wedding clothes for the standard military uniform they all wore. He insisted on helping out where he could, even cooking a few of those bland meals, despite how Aiko pointed out that, as he was their royal guest, they should be waiting on him. Thorin laughed, though, and the suggestion seemed to make Kai even more uncomfortable. While Cinder couldn't imagine him abdicating his throne and setting off on a lifetime of space travel and adventure, it was rather adorable watching him try to fit in. Oh, I was kidding," she said. "Engine rooms are supposed to be this dirty." She examined the filter again, and deeming it satisfactory, twisted it back into the cylinder and bolted it all in place. The humming started up again, but the pebble clatter was gone. Cinder squirmed, feet first. Out from beneath the module and duct work, still crouching, Kai peered down at her and smirked. Aiko's right. You really can't stay clean for more than five minutes. It's part of the job description. She sat up, sending a cascade of lint off her shoulders. Kai brushed some of the larger chunks from her hair. Where did you learn to do all this anyway? What that? Anyone can clean an oxygen filter. Trust me, they can't. He settled his elbows on his knees, and let his attention wander around the engine room. You know what all of this does? She followed the look, 
every wire, every manifold, every compression coil, and shrugged. Pretty much. Except for that big rotating thing in the corner. Can't figure it out. But how important could it be? Kai rolled his eyes. Grasping a pipe, Cinder hauled herself to her feet and shoved the wrench back into her pocket. I didn't learn it anywhere. I just look at things and figure out how they work. Once you know how something works, you can figure out how to fix it. She tried to shake the last bits of dust from her hair, but there seemed to be an endless supply. Oh, you just look at something and figure out how it works, Kai deadpanned, standing beside her. Is that all? Cinder fixed her ponytail and shrugged, suddenly embarrassed. It's just mechanics. Kai scooped an arm around her waist and pulled her against him. What? No, it's impressive, he said, using the pad of his thumb to brush something off Cinder's cheek. Oh my gosh. Not to mention weirdly attractive, he said before capturing her lips. Cinder tensed briefly before melting into the kiss. The rush was the same every time, coupled with surprise and a wave of giddiness. It was their 17th kiss. Her brain interface was keeping a tally. <laughs> Why? Someone against her will. And she wondered if she would ever get used to this feeling. Being desired. When she'd spent her whole life believing no one would ever see her as anything but a bizarre science experiment. Especially not a boy. Especially not Kai, who is smart and honorable and kind, and could have any girl he wanted. Any girl. But no, he chose an alien princess. She sighed against him, leaning into the embrace. Kai reached for an overhead pipe and pressed Cinder against the main computer console. She offered no resistance. Though her body wouldn't allow her to blush, there was an unfamiliar heat that flooded every inch of her when he was this close. This is too much for me. Can we just get on with the story? Every nerve ending sparked and thrummed and she knew he could kiss her another 17,000 times, and she would never grow tired of it. She tied her arms around his neck, molding their bodies together. The warmth of his chest seeped into her clothes. It felt nothing but right, nothing but perfect. But then there was the feeling, always lurking, always ready to cloud her contentment, the knowledge that this couldn't last. Not as long as Kai was engaged to Lavana. Oh my gosh! Cinder is the other woman. Angry at the thought's invasion, she kissed Kai harder, but her thoughts continued to rebel. Even if they succeeded and Cinder was able to reclaim her throne, she would be expected to stay on Luna as their new queen. She was no expert, but it seemed problematic to carry on a relationship on two different planets, or er, a planet and a moon, or whatever. The point was, there would be 384,000 kilometers of space between her and Kai, which was a lot of space, and Kai smiled, breaking the kiss. What's wrong? He murmured against her mouth. Cinder leaned back to look at him. His hair was getting longer, bordering on unkept. As a prince, he'd always been groomed to near perfection, but then he became an emperor. The weeks since his coronation had been spent trying to stop a war, hunt down a wanted fugitive, avoid getting married, and endure his own kidnapping. As a result, haircuts became a dispensable luxury. She hesitated before asking, Do you ever think about the future? Why does this sound like every other relationship? His expression turned away. Of course I do. And does it include me? His gaze softened, releasing the overhead pipe. He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. That depends on whether I'm thinking about the good future or the bad one. Cinder tucked her head under his chin. As long as one of them does. This is going to work, Kai said, speaking into her hair. We're going to win. She nodded, glad he couldn't see her face. Defeating Lavana and becoming Luna's queen was only the beginning of an entire galaxy's worth of worries. She so badly wanted to stay like this, cocooned in the spaceship, together and safe and alone. But that was the opposite of what was going to happen. Once they overthrew Lavana, Kai would go back to being the emperor of the Eastern Commonwealth, and someday he was going to need an empress. It's gonna be you, Cinder. She might have a blood claim to Luna, 
in the hope that the Lunar People would choose anyone over Levana, even a politically inept teenager who is made up of 36.28 cybernetic and manufactured materials. But she had seen the prejudice of the people in the Commonwealth. Something told her they wouldn't be as accepting of her as a ruler. She wasn't even sure she wanted to be empress. It's okay, Winter can take over, though she's kind of a mess. She was still getting used to the idea of being a princess. One thing at a time, she whispered, trying to still her swirling thoughts. Kai kissed her temple, which her brain did not count as number 18, then pulled away. How's your training going? Fine. She disentangled herself from his arms and glanced around the engine. Oh, hey, while you're here, can you help me with this? Cinder scooted around him and opened a panel on the wall, revealing a bundle of knotted wires. That was a subtle change of subject. <clears throat> I'm not changing the subject, she said, although a forced clearing of her throat negated her denial. I'm rewiring the orbital defaults so the ship's system will run more efficiently while we're coasting. These cargo ships are made for frequent landings and takeoffs, not the constant cinder. She pursed her lips and unplugged a few wire connectors. Training is going fine. Training is going fine, she repeated. Can you hand me the wire cutters on the floor? Kai scanned the ground, then grabbed two tools and held them up. Left hand, she said. He handed them to her. Sparring with Wolf has gotten a lot easier, although it's hard to tell if that's because I'm getting stronger or because he's, you know. Is he getting sick? Does he need a doctor? She didn't have a word for it. Wolf had been a shadow of his former self since Scarlet had been captured. Oh. The only thing holding him together was his determination to get to Luna and rescue her as soon as possible. Either way, she added, I think he's taught me as much about my lunar gift as he's going to be able to. From here on, I'll have to wing it. She examined the mess of wires, aligning it with a diagram over her antenna display. Not like that hasn't been my primary tactic this whole time. She furrowed her brow and made a few snips. Here, hold these wires and don't let them touch. Edging against her, Kai took hold of the wires she indicated. What happens if they touch? Oh, probably nothing, but there's a small chance the ship would self-destruct. Pulling out two of the fresh-cut wires, she began to twist them together into a new sequence. Kai hardly breathed until she'd taken one of the threatening wires out of his grip. Why don't you practice on me, he said. Practice what? You know, your mind-manipulating thing. She paused with the cutters hovering over a blue wire. Absolutely not. Why? I said I'd never manipulate you, and I'm sticking with that. It isn't manipulation if I know you're doing it. He hesitated. At least, I don't think so. We could use a code word so I'll know when you're controlling me. Like, what were those called again? Wire cutters? Like wire cutters. No. Or something else. I'm not practicing on you. Slipping the cutters into her pocket, she finished placing the rest of the wires and relieved Kai of his duty. There. We'll see how that goes. Cinder, I have nothing better to do. Literally. Nothing better to do. My time on this ship has taught me that I have zero practical skills. I can't cook. I can't fix anything. I can't help Cress with her surveillance. I know nothing about guns or fighting or... Mostly I'm just a good talker. And that's only useful in politics. <laughs> Oh, this poor boy. Let's not overlook your ability to make every girl swoon with just a smile. It took Kai a moment to hear her over his frustration, but then his expression cleared and he grinned. Yep, she said, shutting the panel. That's the one. I mean it, Cinder. I want to be useful. I want to help. She turned back to face him, frowned, considered. Wire cutters, she said. He tensed. A trace of doubt clouding his expression, but then he lifted his chin, trusting. With the slightest nudge at Kai's will, she urged his arm to reach around her and pull the wrench from her back pocket. It was no more difficult than controlling her own cyborg limbs. A mere thought, and she could have him do anything. Oh no! Kai blinked at the tool. That wasn't so bad. 
Okay. He glanced at her, then back to the wrench. As his hand lifted the tool up to eye level, and his fingers, no longer under his control, began to twirl the wrench. Over one finger, under the other, slow at first, then faster, until the gleaming of the metal looked like a magic trick. Kai gaped, awestruck, but there was an edge of discomfort to it. I always wondered how you did that. Kai. He looked back at her, the wrench still dancing over his knuckles. She shrugged. It's too easy. I could do this while scaling a mountain, or solving complex mathematical equations. His eyes narrowed. You have a calculator in your head. Laughing, she released her hold on Kai's hand. Kai jumped back as the wrench clattered to the ground, realizing he had control of his own limb again. He stood to pick it up. That's beside the point, said Cinder. With Wolf, there's some challenge, some focus required, but with Earthen's... All right, I get it. But what can I do? I feel so useless milling around this ship while the war is going on. And you're all making plans and I'm just waiting. Oh, I know how that feels. She grimaced at the frustration in his tone. Kyra's responsible for billions of people, and she knew he felt like he had abandoned them, even if he hadn't been given a choice, because she hadn't given him a choice. He was kind to her, since the first argument after he'd woken up aboard the Rampion. He was careful not to blame her for his frustrations. It was her fault, though. He knew it, and she knew it. And sometimes it felt like they were caught in a dance Sinner didn't know the steps to. Each of them avoiding the obvious truth, so they didn't disrupt the mutual ground they discovered. The all-too-uncertain happiness they discovered. The only chance we have of succeeding, she said is if you can persuade Lavana to host the wedding on Luna. So right now, you can be thinking about how you're going to accomplish that. Leaning forward, she pressed a soft kiss against his mouth. 18. Good thing you're such a great talker. Chapter 5. Oh, Scarlet. Scarlet pressed her body against the steel bars, straining to grasp a tree branch that dangled just outside her cage. Close. So close. The bar bit into her neck, she flailed her fingers, brushing a leaf, a touch of bark. Yes! Her fingers closed around the branch. She dropped back into her cage, dragging the branch closer. Wiggling her other arm through the bars, she snapped off three leaf-covered twigs, then broke off the tip and let go. The branch swung upward, and a cluster of tiny unfamiliar nuts dropped onto her head. Scarlet flinched and waited until the tree had stopped shaking before she turned the hood of her red sweatshirt inside out and shook out the nuts that had attacked her. They sort of looked like hazelnuts. If she could figure out a way to crack into them, they might not be a bad snack later. A gentle scratching pulled her attention back to the situation. She peered across the menagerie's pathway to the white wolf who was standing on his hind legs and batting at the bars of his own enclosure. Scarlet had spent a lot of time wishing Ryu could leap over those bars his enclosure's wall was waist-high, and she would have been able to clear it easily. Then Scarlet could pet his fur, scratch his ears. What a luxury it would be to have a bit of contact. She had always been fond of the animals on the farm, at least until it was time to slaughter them and cook up a nice ragu. But she never realized how much she appreciated their simple affection until she had been reduced to an animal herself. Unfortunately, Ryu wouldn't be escaping his confinement any sooner than Scarlet would. According to Princess Winter, he had a chip embedded between his shoulder blades that would give him a painful shock if he tried to jump over the rail. The poor creature had learned to accept his habitat a long time ago. Scarlet doubted she would ever accept hers. This is it, she said, grabbing her hard-earned treasure, three small twigs, and a splintered branch. She held them up for the wolf to see. He yipped and did an enthusiastic dance along the enclosure wall. I can't reach you anymore. You have to take your time with these. Ryu's ears twitched, rising to her knees as close to standing as she could get inside her cage. Scarlet grabbed hold of an overhead bar, took aim with one of the smaller twigs, and threw. Ryu chased after it and snatched the stick from the air. Within seconds, he pranced back to his pile of sticks and dropped the twig on top. Pleased, he sat back on his hunches, tongue lolling. Good job, Ryu. 
Nice show of restraint. Sighing, Scarlet picked up another stick. Ryu had just taken off. When she heard the padding of feet down the path, Scarlet sat back on her heels, instantly tense, but relieved when she spotted a flowing cream-colored gown between the stalks of exotic flowers and drooping vines. The princess rounded the path's corner a moment later, basket in hand. Hello, friends, said Princess Winter. Ryu dropped his newest stick onto the pile, then sat down, chest high, as though he were showing her proper respect. Scarlet scowled. Suck up. Winter tilted her head in Scarlet's direction. A spiral of black hair fell across her cheek, obstructing her scars. What did you bring me today? Scarlet asked. Delusional mutterings with a side of crazy? Or is this one of your good days? The princess grinned and sat down in front of Scarlet's cage, uncaring that the path of tumbled black rock and ground covers would soil her dress. This is one of my best days, she said settling the basket on her lap, for I have brought you a treat, with a side of news. Oh, oh, don't tell me. They're moving me to a bigger cage? Oh, please tell me this one comes with real plumbing. And maybe one of those fancy self-feeders the birds get. Though Scarlet's words were laced with sarcasm, in truth, a larger cage with real plumbing would have been a vast improvement. Without being able to stand up, her muscles were becoming weaker, day by day, and it would be heaven if she didn't have to rely on the guards to lead her into the next enclosure. Twice a day, where she was graciously escorted to a trough to do her business. Twice a day? That's awful. A trough. Winter, immune as ever to the bite of Scarlet's tone, leaned forward with a secretive smile. Jason has returned. Scarlet's brow twitched, her emotions at the statement pulling in a dozen directions. She knew Winter had a schoolgirl's crush on this Jason guy, but Scarlet's one interaction with him had been when he was working for a thaumaturg, attacking her and her friends. She convinced herself that he was dead, because the alternative was that he killed Wolf and Cinder, and that was unacceptable. And? She probed. Winter's eyes sparkled. There were times when Scarlet felt like she'd hardened her heart to this girl's impeccable beauty, her thick hair and warm brown skin, her gold-tinged eyes and rosy lips. But then the princess would give her a look like that, and Scarlet's heart would skip, and she would once again wonder how it was possible this wasn't a glamour. Winter's voice turned to a conspirational whisper. Your friends are alive. The simple statement sent the world spinning. Scarlet spent a moment in limbo, distrusting, unwilling to hope. Are you sure? I'm sure. He said that even the captain and the satellite girl were all right. Like a marionette released, she drooped over her knees. Oh, thanks, stars. They were alive. After nearly a month of subsisting on dogged stubbornness, finally, Scarlet had a reason to hope. It was so sudden, so unexpected. She felt dizzy with euphoria. He also said to tell you, Winter continued, and Wolf misses you very much. Well... Jason's words were that he drove everyone rocket mad with his pathetic whining about you. That's sweet, don't you think? Something cracked inside Scarlet. She hadn't cried once since she'd come to Luna. Aside from the tears of pain and delirium, when she was tortured mentally and physically. But now all the fear and all the panic and all the horror welled up inside her and she couldn't hold it back. Couldn't even think beyond the onslaught of sobs and messy tears. They were alive. They were all alive. She knew Cinder was still out there. Word had spread even in the menagerie that she had infiltrated New Beijing Palace and kidnapped the Emperor. Scarlet had felt smug for days when the gossip reached her, even if she didn't have anything to do with the heist. But no one mentioned accomplices. No one said anything about Wolf or Thorn or the satellite girl they'd been trying to rescue. She swiped out her nose and pushed her greasy hair off her face. Winter was watching Scarlet's show of, of emotion like one might watch a butterfly shucking its cocoon. Thank you, said Scarlet, hiccuping back another sob. Thank you for telling me. Of course, you're my friend. Scarlet rubbed her palm across her eyes and for the first time didn't argue. And now for your treat. I'm not hungry. It was a lie, but she come to despise how much she relied on Winter's charity. But it's a sour apple petite, a lunar delicacy that is one of your favorites. Yeah, I know. But I'm not, 
I think you should eat it. The princess's expression was innocent and meaningful all at once. In that peculiar way she had, I think it will make you feel better, she continued, pushing a box through the bars. She waited until Scarlet had taken it from her and stood and made her way across the path to Ryu. She crouched to give the wolf a loving scratch behind his ears, then leaned over the rail and started gathering up his pile of sticks. Scarlet lifted the lid of the box, revealing the red marble-like candy and its bed of spun sugar. Winter had brought her many treats since her imprisonment, most of them laced with painkillers, though the pain from Scarlet's finger, which had been chopped off during her interrogation with the queen, had faded, had faded to a distant memory. The candy still helped with the aches and pains of life in such a cramped quarters. But as she lifted the candy from the box, she saw something unexpected tucked beneath it, a handwritten message. Patience, friend. They're coming for you. She closed the box fast before the security camera over her shoulder could see it and shoved the candy into her mouth, heart thundering. She shut her eyes, hardly feeling the crack of the candy shell, hardly tasting the sweet and sour gooeyness inside. What you said at the trial, said Winter, returning with a bundle of sticks in her arms and laying them down where Scarlet could reach them. I hadn't understood then, but I do now. Scarlet swallowed too quickly. The candy went down hard. Bits of shell scratched her throat. Ow! She coughed, wishing the princess had brought some water too. (coughs) Which part? I was under a lot of Doris, you might recall. The part about Lynn Cinder. Ah, the part about Cinder being the lost Princess Selene, the true Queen of Luna. What about it? She said, bristling with suspicion. Had Jason said something about Cinder's plans to reclaim her throne? And whose side was he on if he spent weeks with her friends, but had now returned to Lavana? Winter considered the question for a long time. What is she like? Scarlet dug her tongue into her molars, thinking. What was Cinder like? She hadn't known her for that long, She was a brilliant mechanic. She seemed to be honorable and brave and determined to do what needed to be done. But Scarlet suspected she wasn't always as confident as she tried to appear on the outside. Also, she had a crush on Emperor Kai, as big as Winter had on Jason. (laughs) Although Cinder tried a lot harder to pretend otherwise. But Scarlet didn't think that answered Winter's question. She's not like Lavana, if that's what you're wondering. Winter exhaled, as if a fear had been released. Ryu whined and rolled onto his back, missing their attention. Winter grabbed a stick from a pile and tossed. The wolf scrambled back to his feet and raced after it. Your wolf friend, Winter said. Is he one of the queens? Not anymore, Scarlet spat. Wolf would never belong to the queen again, not if she could help it. But he was, and now he has betrayed her. The princess's tone had gone dreamy, her eyes staring off into space even after Ryu turned and dropped the stick beside his bars, beginning a new pile. From what I know of her soldiers, that should not be possible. At least, not while they are under the control of their thaumaturg. Suddenly warm, Scarlet unzipped her hoodie. It was filthy with dirt and sweat and blood, but wearing it still made her feel connected to Earth and the farm and her grandmother. It reminded her that she was human, despite being kept in a cage. Wolf's thaumaturg is dead, she said. But Wolf fought against him, even when he was alive. Perhaps they made a mistake with him when they altered his nervous system. It wasn't a mistake, Scarlet smirked. I know, they think they're so clever, giving soldiers the instincts of wild wolves. The instincts to hunt and kill. But look at Ryu. The wolf had lain down and was gnawing at the stick, His instincts lean as much toward playing and loving. If he had a mate and cubs, then his instincts would be to protect them at all costs. Scarlet twirled the cord of her hoodie around her finger. That's what Wolf did. He protected me. She grabbed another stick from the pile outside her cage. Ryu's attention was piqued, but Scarlet only ran her fingers over the peeling bark. I'm afraid I'll never see him again. Winter reached through the bars and stroked Scarlet's hair with her knuckles. Scarlet tensed, but didn't pull away. Contact, any contact, was a gift. Do not worry, said Winter. The queen will not kill you so long as you are my pet. You will have a chance to tell your wolf that you love him. Scarlet glowered. I'm not your pet. 
just like Wolf isn't Lavana's anymore. This time, she did pull back, and Winter let her hand fall into her lap. And it's not that I love him, it's just... She hesitated, and again, Winter listed her head and peered at Scarlet with penetrating curiosity. It was unnerving to think she was being psychoanalyzed by someone who frequently complained that the castle walls had started bleeding again. Wolf is all I have left, Scarlet clarified. She threw the stick halfway across the path. It landed within Pa's reach of Ryu, and he simply stared at it, like it wasn't worth the effort. Scarlet's shoulders slumped. I need him as much as he needs me, but that doesn't make it love. What is going on, Scarlet? You force yourself on Wolf when he said no. You got all shy about him liking you back, and now you're just lying that you love him. Winter lowered her lashes. Actually, dear friend, I suspect that is precisely what makes it love. Chapter 6 These two news feeds include statements from that waitress, Emily Monfort, said Crest, trailing her fingers along the net screen in the cargo bay, pulling up a picture of a blonde-haired girl speaking to a news crew. She claims to be overseeing Benoit Farms and Gardens in Scarlet's absence. Here she makes a comment about the work getting to be a lot for her, and joke that if the Benoits don't return soon, she might have to start auctioning off the chickens. Cress hesitated. Or maybe it wasn't a joke. I'm not sure. Oh, and here she talks about Thorn and Cinder coming to the farm and scaring her witless. She glanced over her shoulder to see whether Wolf was still listening. Aww, Cress is such a good friend. His eyes were glued to the screen, his brow set, as silent and brooding as usual. When he said nothing, she cleared her throat and clicked to a new tab. As far as the finances are concerned, Michelle Benoit did own the land outright, and these bank statements show that the property and business taxes continue to be automatically deducted. I'll set up payments to go through to the labor android rental soon. She missed last month's payment, but I'll make it up. And it looks like she's been a loyal customer long enough. The missed payment didn't interrupt their work. She enlarged a grainy photo. The satellite imagery is from 36 hours ago and shows the full team of androids and two human foremen working this crop. She shrugged and turned to face Wolf. The bills are being paid, the animals are being tended, and the crops are being managed. Any accounts that were expecting regular deliveries are probably annoyed at Scarlet's absence, but that's the worst of it right now. I estimate it can go on being self-sufficient for... Oh, another two, three months? Wolf didn't take his forlorn stare from the satellite image. She loves that farm. And it will be there waiting for her when we get her back. Cress sounded as optimistic as she could. She wanted to add that Scarlet was going to be fine, that every day they were getting closer to rescuing her. But she bit her tongue. The words have been tossed around so much lately. They were beginning to lose their meaning, even to her. The truth was that no one had any idea if Scarlet was still alive or what shape they would find her in. Wolf knew that better than anyone. Is there anything else you want me to look up? He began to shake his head, but stopped. His eyes flashed to her, sharp with curiosity. Cress gulped. Though she warmed to Wolf during her time aboard the ship, he still sort of terrified her. Understandable. Can you find information about people on Luna? Her shoulders sank with an apology. If I could have found out about her by now, I... Not Scarlet, he said, his voice rough when he said her name. I've been wondering about my parents. Ooh, parents. She blinked. Parents. She had never imagined Wolf with parents. The idea of this hulking man having once been a dependent child didn't fit. In fact, she couldn't imagine any of the Queen's soldiers having parents. Having once been children, having once been loved, but of course they had. Once. Oh, right, she stammered, smoothing down the skirt of the worn cotton dress she'd taken from the satellite, what felt like ages ago, though she'd spent a day wearing one of the military uniforms found in her crew quarters, a lifetime spent barefoot and in simple dresses had made the clothes feel heavy and cumbersome. Plus, all of the pants were way too big on her. Do you think you might see them when we're on Luna? It's not a priority. He said it like a military general, but his expression carried more emotion than his voice. But I wouldn't mind knowing if they're still alive, maybe seeing them again.
someday. His jaw flexed. I was 12 when I was taken away. They must think I'm dead, or a monster. The statement resonated through her body, leaving her chest vibrating. For 16 years, her father thought she was dead too. While she'd been told that her parents had willingly sacrificed her to lunar shell infanticide, she barely been reunited with her father before he died of limosis in the labs at New Beijing Palace. She tried to mourn his death, but mostly she mourned the idea of having a father at all and the loss of all the time they should have had to get to know each other. She still thought of him as Dr. Erlin, the odd curmudgeon old man who had started the cyborg draft in the Eastern Commonwealth, who had dealt in shell trafficking in Africa. He was also the man who helped Cinder escape from prison. So many things he'd done, some good, some terrible. In all, Cinder had told her, because he was determined to end Levana's rule. To avenge his daughter. To avenge her. Cress? She jolted. Sorry, I don't... I can't access Luna's database from here. But once we're on Luna... Never mind, it doesn't matter. Wolf leaned against the cockpit wall and clawed his hand into his unkept hair. He looked like he was on the verge of a meltdown, but that was his normal look these days. Scarlet's the priority, the only priority. Cress considered mentioning that overthrowing Levana and crowning Cinder as queen were decent-sized priorities too, but she dared not. Have you mentioned your parents to Cinder? He cocked his head. Why? I don't know. She mentioned not having any allies on Luna, how it would be useful to have more connections. Maybe they would help us? His gaze darkened, both thoughtful and annoyed. It would put them in danger. I think Cinder might intend to put a lot of people in danger. Cress worried at her lower lip, then sighed. Is there anything else you need? For time to move faster. Cress wilted. I mean more like food or something. When did you last eat? Wolf's shoulders hunched closer to his ears and the guilty expression was all the answer she needed. She heard rumors of his insatiable appetite and the high-octane metabolism that kept him always fidgeting, always moving. She'd hardly seen any of that since coming aboard the ship, and she could tell that Cinder, in particular, was worried about him. Only when they were discussing strategies for Cinder's revolution did he seem rejuvenated, his fists flexing and tightening, like the fighter he was meant to be. All right. I'm going to make you a sandwich. Standing, Cress gathered her courage, along with her most demanding voice, and planted a hand on her hip. And you are going to eat it without argument. You need to keep up your strength if you're going to be any use to us. And Scarlet. Wolf raised an eyebrow at her, newfound gumption. Cress flushed. Or at least eat some canned fruit or something. His expression softened. A sandwich sounds good. With... Tomatoes, if we have any left, please. Ugh, him and those tomatoes. Of course. Drawing in a deep breath, she grabbed her port screen and headed toward the galley. Cress? She paused and turned back, but Wolf was looking at the floor, his arms crossed. He looked about as awkward as she usually felt. Thank you. Her heart expanded, ballooning with sympathy for him. Words of comfort sprang to her tongue. She'll be all right. Scarlet will be all right but Cress stuffed them back down. You're welcome, she said, before turning into the corridor. She had nearly reached the galley when she heard Thorn call her name. She paused and backtracked to the last door, left slightly ajar, and pressed it open. The captain's quarters were the largest of the crew cabins and the only room that didn't have bunks. Though Cress had been inside plenty of times to help him with the eyedrop solution Dr. Erlen made in order to repair Thorn's damaged optical nerve, she never lingered long. Even with the door wide open, the room felt too intimate, too personal. There was a huge map of Earth on one wall, filled with Thorne's handwritten notes and marks indicating the places he'd been and the places he wanted to go, along with a dozen to scale models of different spaceships scattered across the captain's deck, including a prominent one of a 214 Rampion. The bed was never made. The first time she'd been in that room, she asked Thorne about the map and listened captivated while he talked about the things he'd seen, from ancient ruins to thriving metropolises, tropical forests to white sand beaches. His descriptions had filled Cress with longing, 
She was happy here on the spaceship. It was roomier than her satellite had been, and the bond she was forming with the rest of the crew felt like friendship. But she had still seen so little of Earth, and the thought of seeing those things while standing at Thorne's side, her fingers laced together. The fantasy made her pulse race every time. Thorne was sitting in the middle of the floor, holding a port screen at arm's length. Did you call me? She asked. A grin dawned on his face, impishly delighted. Cress! I thought I heard your footsteps. Come here. He circled his whole arm, like he could draw her forward with a vacuum it created. When she reached his side, Thorne flailed his hand around until he found her wrist and pulled her down beside him. It's finally working, he said, holding up the port again with his free hand. Cress blinked at the small screen. A net drama was playing, though the feed was muted. Was it broken? No, the solution. It's working. I can see. Releasing her wrist, he waved a finger in the screen's direction. Kind of a bluish light, and the lights in the ceiling. He tilted his head back, eyes wide, and pupils dilating, as they tried to take in as much information as they could. They're more yellow than the screen. That's it, though. Light and dark. Some blurry shadows. That's wonderful! Although Dr. Erlen believed Thorne's eyesight would begin to improve after a week or so, that week had come and gone, with no change. It had now been nearly two weeks since the solution had run out. Oh no! And she knew the weight had tried, even Thorne's relentless optimism. I know! Crushing his eyes shut, Thorne lowered his head again. Except it's kind of giving me a headache. You shouldn't overdo it, you might strain them. He nodded and pressed a hand over both eyes. Maybe I should wear a blindfold again, until things start to come into focus. It's up here. Cress stood and found the blindfold and the empty vial of eye drops nestled among the model ships. When she turned around, Thorne was looking at her, or through her. His brow tensed. She froze. It had been a long time since he looked at her, and back then, they'd been scrambling for their lives. That had been before he cut her hair, too. She sometimes wondered how much he remembered about what she looked like and what he would think when he saw her again, practically for the first time. I can see her shadow, sort of, he said, cocking his head. Kind of a hazy silhouette. Gulping, Cress folded the blindfold into his palm. Give it time, she said, pretending the thought of him inspecting her, seeing every unspoken confession written across her face, wasn't terrifying. The doctor's notes said your optical nerve would continue to heal for weeks on its own. Let's hope it starts healing faster after this. I don't like seeing blurs and shadows. He twisted the blindfold between his fists. One of these days, I just want to open my eyes and see you. Oh my gosh! Heat rushed into her cheeks. But the depth of his words hadn't sunk in before Thorne laughed and scratched his ear. But, I mean, and everyone else too, of course. I mean, and everyone else too, of course. She smothered the start of a giddy smile, cursing herself for getting her hopes up again. For the thousandth time, when Thorne had made it quite clear, he saw her as nothing more than a good friend and a loyal member of his crew. He hadn't tried to kiss her again, not once since the battle atop the palace rooftop. And sometimes she thought he might be flirting with her, but then he'd start flirting with Cinder or Aiko, and she'd remember that our touch here or a smile there wasn't special to him like it was to her. Oh, I understand, Cress, I understand. Of course, she said, moving backward toward the door. Of course you want to see everyone. She stifled a sigh, realizing she was going to have to train herself not to stare at him quite as often as she was used to. Otherwise, there'd be no chance of hiding the fact that, despite all his attempts to persuade her otherwise, she was still hopelessly in love with him.